Hi, this is Scott Garibay, and today we're going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons in its 45th year of history, 2018. We're going to talk about 2018 through the filter of clear, catalyst, location, entity, artifact, and relationship. All right, so who was the catalyst for Dungeons and Dragons in the year 2018? Well, it was a lady by the name of Kate Welch, and she's incredibly important in the history of Dungeons and Dragons. And in my opinion, she's essentially the future of Dungeons and Dragons. So let's talk about Kate Welch. All right, so uh, yesterday on Twitter, Kate Welch put out a, a tweet that said, five years ago, I didn't even play Dungeons and Dragons. And today I'm on the design team, all right? So paraphrasing a little bit, but she was saying, don't give up your dreams. Uh, just because you haven't been in something for a decade or two decades, just because you haven't done this something forever, doesn't mean you can't do it at, at, world, at world-class level, right? And that's exactly what she's done, right? Uh, Kate Welch has never written a tabletop role-playing game, um, you know, a distinct one on her own. Uh, prior to being hired uh, by Wizards of the Coast to be on the Dungeons & Dragons design team, to my knowledge, she had never written a single adventure, right? Uh, what she had done was she was on a streaming game, right? Uh, which, again, tells you the incredible power and importance of streaming games to modern Dungeons & Dragons. They really are shaping how the game is played, who, who's involved in the community, uh, and at what level they're involved in the community. So she had been uh, involved in a streaming game. Uh, she was on the C team, and the C team was connected with Penny Arcade, which is a multi-million dollar uh, corp- uh, company um, which uh, does web comics about video games, right? Uh, Mike Krahulik and uh, Jerry Hawkins, I think is his name. Um, and um, they, the two of them together uh, have, have really built an empire and uh, like basically around video games, right? And just one of their side interests is Dungeons & Dragons. And Kate Welch was attached to that side interest and her success on the C team, uh, in many ways, uh, it looks like it, it helped her to get the, to win the Dungeons & Dragons design team position that she was hired for. Now, to be clear, there were thousands of designers who wanted to be on the Dungeons & Dragons design team, and she beat out all of them. So there was a big question on why, how did Kate Welch beat out all these other people? Well, she has some skills that have been woefully absent on the uh, on the Dungeons and Dragons design thing. One, she's a ge- as a general communicator, right? So uh, when she communicates, she has a big smile on her face. She can talk to almost anyone very, very easily on a multitude of subjects, jump right in. Uh, she can win goodwill very quickly. She is a very, very strong communicator. She can listen. She can get her point across. She can do that quickly, and she can do that pretty easily with a vast variety of people, right? So she's a really, really strong communicator. Not only can she do that in IRL, she can also do that digitally probably better than she's able to do it in IRL. So her communication skills are, in my opinion, are absolutely unmatched by anyone who's ever been on the design team, not even close, right? And one of the reasons I think why this was important is, it is, this is purely my opinion, right? I believe Kate Welch was hired to be mentored during 5th edition to be the lead design on 6th edition. And the reason why that is, is Dungeons & Dragons has a 45-year history of never once, ever, having a female lead for the design team. Now, when you have a pattern for 45 years, that is no longer a, um, that's no longer an accident. Right? That is people making choices, right? And so I think, it's my opinion, that Wizards of the Coast recognized a huge problem in the history of the game and said, we've got to fix this now, right? And I think that's why Kate Welch. And so if what I'm saying is correct and Kate Welch is being mentored to be the design lead on 6th edition, then it will change the pattern for Dungeons & Dragons and for the first time in the history of the game in over four decades with thousands and thousands of female players there will be finally representation for them within the game at the design lead level right so k welch is incredibly important to the history of dungeons and dragons um she's uh to my knowledge one of the very first uh um 
female uh, females to even serve on the design team. And I that that might be. Please, I ask you to correct me if there was somebody who was who was on that design team first, right? Um, but to, she is certainly one of the very few women who have served on the design team. And I believe her trajectory is different than any other female that's ever been uh, been attached to Dungeons and Dragons. So Kate Welch is clearly the catalyst for 2018. It's a huge change in direction. What is our location for Dungeons and Dragons in the year 2018? Well, our location for Dungeons and Dragons in the year 2018 is Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, right? And specifically, it is just a little tiny shop in Dubai that is called Back to Games, and Back to Games is an FLGS in the middle of the United Arab Emirates in Dubai, right? And the reason why we're talking about it to get today is we have talked about a lot of locations where Dungeons and Dragons have played, but the reality is, uh, in you know, um, I read an article in Forbes about uh, Back to Games, and the reason why the, why the store is called Back to Games is. Dubai does not have a strong history of board gaming, tabletop gaming, tabletop miniature games. Um, actually, uh, the, the the country that Dubai, you know, the United Arab Emirates, uh, gaming is not a huge part of their culture, and it has not been um, a robust tabletop gaming community has not been part of their culture for a long time. And so the owner of Back to Games, this uh, FLGS in, in Dubai, talked very much about, you know, kind of kind of reestablishing board games and tabletop gaming as part of the, the culture of the United Arab Emirates, right? And so, and it points to, for us as Dungeons and Dragons, this game has spread to virtually every corner of the world. And absolutely, Dungeons and Dragons has been played in Dubai, but the numbers are very, very low. And, uh, and, and it, it, it shows us as a community that there are still many places on the earth where Dungeons and Dragons has been mentioned, it's been played briefly, it's been played infrequently, it's been played in incredibly low numbers. And those areas are available to win, to for the game to grow. And that's exciting. Well, who is our entity in the year 2018? Right? Well, our, year, our, our entity in the year 2018 is Christy Yamaguchi. Now, Qu Christy Yamaguchi is a, an Olympic gold medalist. She won gold for the U.S. in 1992. But in 2018, she came on to a show called Fresh Off the Boat. Fresh Off the Boat is part of a series of, um, or actually a disconnected series, of new situation comedies that are specifically set within, um, within a specific, that have the background of trying to embrace the culture of a specific people. So for, um, specifically for uh, Fresh Off the Boat, uh, it's Chinese culture, right? And it tells the story, uh, I believe the gentleman's name is Eddie Wong, um, and Fresh Off, fr fresh off the Boat tells the story of a young Chinese uh, boy growing up with Chinese, um, with immigrant parents, right? And it's trying to tell uh, in a comedic way, his story and his experience in America. There are other shows like this. Uh, another show like this is I Feel Bad, which uh, explores Indian culture, and another show like this is Blackish, which uh, explores um, African American culture in, in, of course, in America, right? And Christy Yamaguchi came on to this show, right? She's, she's an Olympic gold medalist, right? And the reason why she came on to this show is this show is important to her, at, you know, as, um, as somebody who has Chinese heritage. And uh, she wanted to be part of, of that experience and help celebrate on the show uh, essentially the display that the show has to help others understand more about that culture and for that culture to have a place where um, it's, it's put on shine the way, uh, I would say, Anglo-American <laughs> uh, culture has been put on shine for decades or centuries within within American entertainment. And so it's a really unique, uh, unique spot. And Christy Yamaguchi is part of that, you know, is part of that new trend where in our entertainment, we're trying to go back and say, hey, we have a lot of cultures in America, right? And we should be celebrating all of them. We should be putting as many as we can front and center and give everybody a turn where, you know, where their stories are being told 
in 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 a manner that has goodwill attached to it and has momentum, right? And so Christy Yamaguchi is part of that in, in the year 2018, right? And of course, Dungeons and Dragons absolutely is doing the same thing where it is incredible, especially with 5th edition and certainly going into 6th edition, it is incredibly aware of the different cultures that are playing the game and they want to make sure that the game is accessible and that each pe the people from different cultures find something that has relevance to them, that resonates with them, right? It's a really, really important, um, important aspect. So what is our artifact for the year 2018? Our artifact is an Onyx Star Xena 8F coax foldable drone, right? Now this is a drone, right? Now drones are a new, uh, essentially, especially in 2018, they were absolutely an artifact and this specific drone uh, was a highly purchased right highly capable not cheap <laughs> um example of a drone and in 2018 drones were really being talked about drones did all kinds of exciting new things um there were new types of sports that were played with drones right uh drones began are, are continuing to grow as a hobby for for many many americans they also expanded the accessibility and the uh they also expanded the reach of cameras right uh, most drones are now are are uh, fitted with cameras, and so wherever drones go, the 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 operators of those drones can see into areas that previously they did not have access to, right? Especially from a bird's eye view, literally a bird's eye view, right? So so drones are a huge part of 2018, and how technology is changing our world, right? And so drones specifically what they do is they make areas that be, that previously were very expensive to access and that only a few different people like previously if you wanted a bird's eye view of anywhere that was within 20 miles of your home, you needed to own a helicopter, right? But if you but now if you have $1000 and you can operate a drone, boom, you could have you can look wherever you want whenever you want, right? And that's massively different. It's very very different. Um, drones were also talked about for delivery for like Amazon, and so right there, you know, uh, what does this artifact have to do? Well, first edition, second edition, third edition, fourth edition, fifth edition, all of these editions got to the store, right, uh, to be sold. All of the those physical books for that for those editions were hand carried by human beings. They were put on UPS trucks. They were put on mail trucks, right? They were put on uh, delivery trucks, right? And then hand carried in by human beings. But there's a possibility, and there are people planning right now that the sixth edition of Dungeons and Dragons could be carried into Barnes and Noble with a drone, right? Like, or might be hand delivered, or might be delivered, right? Drone delivered to your door, right? The, ver the very books themselves. Now this is nascent technology, but drones are a huge part of modern of modern technology, and we're just now seeing their potential. Right? What is Dungeons and Dragons' relationship in the year 2018? Dungeons and Dragons' relationship in the in the year 2018 is with resilience. Dungeons and Dragons is a game that has resilience. More than one time in its uh, in actually multiple times in its history it has been struck with hardships it has been struck with trials okay um, it came out in 1974 not even a decade passed before there was major major pushback against the against against the game uh, with different groups saying this game is connected to the occult this connect game is connected to violence, this game is connected to all kinds of terrible things. So the satanic panic happened in the 80s, right? One more decade later, you're sitting in the 90s, Dungeons and Dragons is back on its feet, Magic the Gathering rolls in and steals, steals huge, huge volume from its player base, right? Um, and, and Magic the Gathering arrives on the scene and announces itself as a tabletop game uh, with, with success rates that have never, ever been seen anywhere in the hobby previously. Excuse me. So, Magic the Gathering was a major threat to, to the game, right? One decade later, you're in the 2000s. What happens? 
fourth edition launches, at li like literally half of the entire player base says, do not want. And here again, you know, so you see it in the 80s, you see it in the 90s, you see it in the 2000s, right? It doesn't seem like there's been a single decade that um, Dungeons and Dragons hasn't been hit, just smashed in the teeth with a major trial, right? Um, something, someone coming for it, coming to tear it down, right? Coming to make its existence difficult, right? But the game is resilient. It is like nothing that has ever been created. It is an art vector. It is a game. It is literature, right? It is a scholastic pursuit. And at the same time, artists pursue it, right? So people who are intelligent, people who are creative, people who are artistic are drawn to it, right? And it really has no peer. There's nothing like it. Dungeons and Dragons is completely unique. It's completely American, right, uh, in, it, in its origin source. And it truly is, uh, and I believe, right, because of its uniqueness and because of its Americanness and because of its creator, the game is fundamentally, it is naturally resilient, right? And so at this point in time, it is my opinion, right, that Dungeons & Dragons has reached a point where it will never ever be out of print. I truly believe that. And the reason why is it's, it is a niche product. It's a niche pursuit, right? Only low millions, uh, participate in this hobby, even throughout the world, right? Uh, I don't even think our, you know, our, our numbers are like eight or nine million and they were, they were eight or nine million in 2018. And we don't, we're not even into double digit millions, right? Which, which scrub video games get double digit midget million, uh, view, yeah, uh, purchases, right? Um, but our game is really struggling to get that mass called commercial success, right? But with that said, right, um, one of the things though is the people who are interested, they are gen, the game ha is self selecting that people who are intelligent, creative, and artistic love this game, and the millions that we have are filled with with intelligent, creative, artistic people. Guess what? This world absolutely rewards. We are in a knowledge worker world now, right? And this world monetarily rewards creativity, intelligence, and artistry. So the people who are interested in the game have money. And it is my opinion that that fact alone will protect the game as it moves forward. And I think, believe it or not, even as print is massively under threat, I do not think Dungeons and Dragons is massively under threat. I think the odds that some millionaire would not come forward and snatch this game from the jaws of uh, of, of fate, right? That 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 would come along again to tear it down. I think there'll always be someone there to stand up and to to preserve it, right? Now, right now, I will say this right now: I am super super thankful for every single thing Hasbro is doing to Hasbro. Hasbro is doing to protect Dungeons and Dragons. I think Dungeons and Dragons has been in wonderful, wonderful hands uh, since 2000 when when Hasbro brought it in. They have protected this game for for uh, for 18 years. They have grown this game for 18 years, and I personally, Scott Garibay, am incredibly thankful to Hasbro for everything they've done for Dungeons and Dragons. And I hope that Dungeons and Dragons is with Hasbro for. I would love to see Dungeons and Dragons with them for another 50 to 100 years. I truly would. Because I think they know the value of it. And I, um, I th you know, I think they're good guardians. They're, they're good guardians of the game. Um, with, with that said, uh, just because I, I am clearly a student of Dungeons and Dragons history, I think the game, there are trials that rise up to put this game at threat. And it is very clear to me, right? that I think there'll be another trial that'll come up. And if this bounces out of the hands of Hasbro, I am not worried. <laughs> I truly believe that there will always be people who will print the next edition of Dungeons and Dragons, who will make sure the polyhedral dice are available, and will make sure that at some table, somewhere, uh, some young lady is slaying a dragon with her player character. I truly, truly believe that is the future of this game. Uh, that is a clear history of the 45th year of Dungeons and Dragons, the year 2018. Uh, please let me know your opinion 
on the resilience of the game. Do you think I'm right? Do you think Dungeons & Dragons will always be with us going forward because it's it's shown its value to the world and there'll always be somebody there to pick it up um, and, and carry it forward to that next edition? Uh, i really love to hear your opinion on that um, uh, in the comments below. Uh, please consider liking and subscribing and have a wonderful day.